Hello and welcome to this tutorial on Advanced Life Support Drugs which is adapted from the Australian and New Zealand Resuscitation Council guidelines released at the end of December 2010. For this YouTube version of this tutorial we're going to cover the roles and purposes of Advanced Life Support Drugs, principles of administration and the overview of common medications. Unfortunately we're not going to cover case studies and examples. The purpose of resuscitation medications are to improve organ perfusion during CPR, how to help facilitate defibrillation, to help prevent the recurrence of malignant arrhythmias, increase the excitability and conduction during profound bradycardia or asystole, to try and normalize the metabolic derangements and also to help provide cerebral protection. Although the drugs that are used in advanced life support have a lot of theoretical benefits in selected situations, no medication has been shown to actually improve long-term survival in humans after cardiac arrest. Your immediate priorities in cardiac arrest are CPR, external cardiac massage, defibrillation and oxygenation and ventilation. The best chance of long-term intact neurological survival after cardiac arrest occurs when these criteria are met. The collapse is witnessed and CPR is commenced immediately. The underlying rhythm of the cardiac arrest is either VT or VF and the person is defibrillated as soon as possible. Some general principles include minimal disruption to the actual resuscitation going on, that is cardiac compressions. You should try and gain immediate IV access and if you can't then you should go for the next best route which is intraosseous. Finally there is the endotracheal route for some medications however this has been de-emphasized significantly in the newer guidelines. If able use central venous access however not all patients have that. Arterial access for specific blood samples and blood pressure monitoring is for ideal situations only and time should not be wasted trying to obtain arterial access when more important actions need to be done such as CPR, the drawing up of medications and defibrillation. The delivery of advanced life support drugs through vascular access devices such as central lines or peripheral lines is important. A large bore cannula 14 to 16 gauge should be put into each antecubital fossa. Avoidance of the lower limbs should be done as it would take a long time for those medications to reach the heart in CPR, so upper body is preferred. The external jugular vein should also be considered. Ideally a central line is what is required, however in an arrest situation it is not that easy to put those in. Whatever drug is given via intravenous access, it should be followed by a 30 mil flush of normal saline to ensure that it is well distributed. If intravenous access is unable to be obtained, the next preferred route is the intraosseous. The intraosseous route is very safe and drugs and fluid can be administered very quickly and receive adequate plasma concentrations rapidly. It is also worth mentioning that blood samples can be taken via the intraosseous route. The one exception to the blood results that won't be accurate is the white cell count. Some medications can be administered via the endotracheal route. However, it is not recommended as absorption is highly variable and plasma concentrations are substantially lower than the IV route. No drugs can be given via an LMA. The drugs that can be administered via endotracheal access are adrenaline, lignocaine and atropine. The drug dose needs to be at least 3 to 10 times the intravenous dose and it must be diluted in 10 mils of sterile water. Prior to administering the drug, the airway should be suctioned and the catheter should be passed beyond the tip of the endotracheal tube. Once that's done, instill the drug via the catheter, the suction catheter that is. Afterwards, two vigorous ventilations are needed to disperse the drug into the lungs. It is worth remembering that the drug absorption will be slower than the IV administration route and transient decreases in oxygenation and pH after drug administration can occur. Some drug changes in the latest guidelines include For shockable rhythms, adrenaline 1mg is given after the second defibrillation 
and then concurrently after every second shock which is about four minutes amiodarone 300 milligrams is also given but after the third shock in non-shockable rhythms adrenaline one milligram is given immediately then every four minutes Adrenaline is a naturally occurring endogenous catecholamine with alpha and beta receptor effects. The theory behind giving adrenaline is because it improves the effectiveness of cardiopulmonary resuscitation by causing peripheral vasoconstriction and increasing cerebral and coronary artery perfusion. This enhances the effectiveness of defibrillation by improving myocardial blood flow. The normal dose given in an arrest situation is one milligram intravenously or intraosseously. You should give the adrenaline immediately if the victim is in a non-shockable rhythm such as PEA or asystole. If they are in a shockable rhythm such as VF or VT the first dose of adrenaline should be given after the second shock. After that you should give every second cycle in both arms of the non-shockable and shockable algorithm. Here are some pictures of some different concentrations of adrenaline. In the ampule on the top, on the top left, you can see that it's one milligram in 1,000. While on the mini jet to the right, which holds 10 mils, it's actually one milligram in 10,000. This short video shows how you should prepare a mini jet. It's actually quite easy, but like most things, it's easy when you know how. Amiodarone is normally given after the third defibrillation in resistant VTVF. It is a complex class 3 antiarrhythmics with its primary effects of blocking potassium channels, which slows conduction and prolongs refractory periods. Its secondary effects include sodium channel blocking, which decreases the conduction velocity, and also causes alpha 1 blocking, which actually causes vasodilation. Its beta-1 effects include decreasing heart rate and contractility and it also on top of all of that has a calcium channel blocking effect which decreases the AV node conduction. The indications as mentioned earlier for amiodarone are for VF or pulseless VT unresponsive to initial defibrillations and adrenaline. The initial bolus dose is 300 milligrams diluted in 20 mils of 5% glucose, which is then injected over a two minute period. If it seems to be helping, repeated doses of 150 milligrams may be administered and a continuous infusion of 15 milligrams a kilogram over 24 hours can be started. The initial dose is for unresponsive VF or pulseless VT is given after the third shock it should never be given for somebody who is in conscious VT. Because of its vasodilation effects, it may actually push somebody into an arrest if you give amiodarone over a two minute period. Atropine is a parasympathetic antagonist which blocks the action of the vagus nerve. It is no longer recommended for use in asystole in cardiac arrest. However, it still holds a place in peri-arrest rhythms such as bradycardias. In such a case, Doses of 500 to 600 micrograms can be repeated every 3 to 5 minutes, up to a total of 3 milligrams. Once the cumulative dose of 3 milligrams has been given, the parasympathetic nerve has been completely blocked by atropine and further doses will be ineffectual. Lignocaine is a class 1 antiarrhythmic which blocks sodium channels. This decreases conduction velocity. Its indications are for VF or pulseless VT unresponsive to initial defibrillation and adrenaline and its use has been largely relegated by the better antiarrhythmic amiodarone. However, it still has a place as not everybody can tolerate amiodarone. The dose to be given of amine is 1 to 1.5 mg a kilogram bolus with an additional dose of 0.5 mg a kilogram being considered if it is, if it is effective. Side effects of lignocaine include hypertension, heart block, asystole, bradycardia, dizziness, paresthesia, slurred speech, altered consciousness, seizures and muscle twitching and you should not give it as an infusion until a perfusible rhythm is present. 
Calcium is essential for normal muscle or nerve activity and it increases myocardial excitability, contractility and peripheral resistance. In cardiac arrest, its indications are for severe hyperkalemia greater than 7 millimoles, severe hypocalcemia and overdose of calcium channel blocking drugs. In cardiac arrest, calcium chloride is preferred over calcium glutaconate as it contains more 3 calcium. 5 to 10 mils of 10% calcium chloride is given via slow IV injection, 1 to 2 mils per minute. Possible side effects include increased myocardial and cerebral damage, arrhythmias, hypertension, vasodilation from a rapid IV injection, some venous irritation and severe tissue necrosis if extravasation of the calcium chloride occurs. Sodium bicarbonate is a systemic alkalizing agent. Increasing plasma bicarbonate levels and buffering excess hydrogen concentrations its indications are for severe metabolic acidosis, unresponsive to optimal CPR, oxygenation and ventilation. It can also be given in the hyperkalemic patient and tricyclic overdoses or in prolonged arrests that go on for greater than 15 minutes. The dosage of sodium bicarbonate given in arrest is 1 millimole per kilogram over 2 to 3 minutes. Side effects include alkalosis, Hypernatremia due to the high sodium content of 1 millimole per mil inside sodium bicarbonate and hyperosmolarity. Some precautions include sodium bicarbonate and adrenaline or calcium will precipitate in the line if given together. Potassium is an important electrolyte for membrane stability. In a cardiac arrest situation, the indications for giving potassium are for hyperkalemia or persistent VF associated with hypokalemia. In cardiac arrest situations only, a bolus of 5 millimoles of potassium chloride can be given for documented hypokalemia. Once again, this can only be given in a cardiac arrest situation. Some side effects of giving potassium include tissue necrosis with extravasation, hyperkalemia with excessive use and bradycardia. Magnesium is also an important electrolyte for membrane stability, with low levels of magnesium leading to myocardial hyperexcitability and arrhythmias. The indications for giving magnesium include hypomanganesia, torsades de ponts, arrests associated with digoxin toxicity, documented hypokalemia and resistant VTVF. The dose of magnesium given in an arrest situation is a bolus dose of 5 millimoles which can be repeated once only. This can be then followed up with an infusion of 20 millimoles of magnesium over 4 hours. Some side effects of rapid magnesium administration include muscle weakness, paralysis and respiratory failure. Vasopressin is commonly referred to as antidiuretic hormone and it is important in the normal regulation of body fluids. It acts as a vasoconstrictor and is a very effective vasopressor. However, studies have demonstrated no difference in outcomes compared to adrenaline. This brings to a close this brief tutorial on advanced life support drugs. In summary, adrenaline is always indicated. It is just the timing that is important. Atropine is no longer used in a systolic cardiac arrest. All drugs given via the intravenous or intraosseous route should be followed by a 30 ml flush of normal saline. And there must be a clear indication for any other drug to be given.